Hello, welcome to my recording of the great, great audiobook of Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. If you like this book and you need stuff to do with the book, teachers, head on over to my Teacher Pay Teacher store. It's just SWN, uh, the S, the letter WN, uh, and you'll find a whole lot of stuff over there like Google Forms and questions that go along with this book as well. So enjoy the story. Chapter 18. Just before dawn, the storm blew itself out with one last angry roar. It started snowing. A frozen silence settled over the cane break. Back in the thick timber of the river bottoms, the sharp snapping of the frozen limbs could be heard. The tall stalks of wild cane looked exhausted from the hellish night. They were drooping and bending from the weight of the frozen sleet. I clam climbed out of the deep gully and listened for my dogs. I couldn't hear them. Just as I started back down the bank, I heard something. I listened. Again, I heard the sound. Pablo was watching me. Can you hear the dogs? he asked. No, not the dogs, I said. But I, I can't hear some, something else. What does it sound like? He, he asked. Like someone whooping, I said. Papa and the judge hurried up the bank, and we heard the sound again. It was coming from a different direction. The first time I heard it, I said, it, it was over that way. It's the men from the camp, the judge said. They're searching for us. We started whooping. The searchers answered, and their voices came from all directions. The first one to reach us was Mr. Kyle. He looked haggard and tired. He asked us if everything was all right. Yeah, we're all right, Papa said, but the old man had a bad an has a bad ankle. It looks like we'll have to carry him out. Well, your team broke loose and came back to the camp about midnight, Mr. Kyle said. This really spooked us. We were sure something bad had happened. Twenty-five of us have been searching since then. Several men climbed down the bank and went over to Grandpa. They looked at his ankle and one said, Well, I don't think it's broken, but it sure is a bad sprain. Yeah, you're in luck, another one said. We've had one of the best doctors in the state of Texas in our camp, Dr. Charlie Latham. He'll have you fixed up in no time. Yeah, another one said. And if I know Charlie, he's probably going to got a small hospital with him. And back in the crowd, I heard another man say, You mean that Latham fellow who owns those black and tan hounds is a doctor? Sure is, another said. One of the best. Mr. Kyle asked where my dogs were. I told him that they, had, they were treed somewhere. What do you mean, treed somewhere, he asked. Papa explained what had happened. With a wide-eyed look on his face, he said, Do you mean to tell me those hounds stayed with the tree in that blizzard? I nodded. Looking at me, he said, well, Son, I hope they have that coon treed because you need that one to win the cup. Those two walker hounds caught three before the storm came up, and when it got bad, all the hunters came in. The judge spoke up. I'll always believe that these hounds knew that that boy needed another coon to win, if you fellows had seen some of the things those dogs have done, you'd believe it too. One hunter walked over to the broken snag. Three out of one tree. <laughs> no wonder. Look here. That old snag was half full of leaves and grass. Why, it was a regular old den tree. Several of the men walked over and I heard one say, Yeah, I've, heard, I've seen this happen before. Remember that big hunt in the Red River Bottoms when the two little beagle hounds treed four coons and an old hollow snag? <laughs> they won the championship, too. I wasn't there, but I remember reading about it, one said. <clears throat> Say, I, I don't see Benson, Mr. Kyle said. The men started looking at each other. He was searching further down river than the rest of us, one fellow said. Maybe he didn't hear a shouting. Some of the men climbed out of the gully. They started whooping, and from a distance we heard an answering shout. Oh, he hears us, someone said. He's coming. Everyone looked relieved. Mr. Benson struck the washout a little way above us. He was breathing hard as if he had been running. He started talking as soon as he was within hearing distance. It scared me when I first saw them, he said. I, I didn't know what they were. They looked like little white ghosts. I I'd never seen anything like it. The hunter grabbed Mr. Benson by the shoulder, shaking him. Get a hold of yourself, man! What are you talking about? Mr. Benson took a deep breath to control himself and started again in a much calmer voice. Those two hounds, 
he said. I found them. They're frozen solid. There's nothing but white ice from the tips of their noses to the ends of their tails. Hearing Mr. Benson's words, I screamed and ran to my father. Everything started whirling around and around, and I felt light as a feather. My knees buckled. I knew no more. Regaining consciousness, I opened my eyes and could dimly see the blurry images of the men around me. A hand was shaking me. I could hear my father's voice, but I couldn't understand his words. Little by little, the blackness faded away. My throat was dry, and I was terribly thirsty. I asked for some water. Mr. Benson came over, and he said, Son, I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. I, I didn't mean it that way. Your dogs are alive. I, I guess I was excited. I'm very sorry. I heard a deep voice say, That's a hell of a thing to do, come running here saying the dogs are frozen solid. Mr. Benson said, I didn't mean it to sound that way. I said I'm sorry. What more do you want me to do? The deep voice growled again. I still think it was a hell of a thing to do for a man to do. Mr. Crowell took over. Now, nah, let's not have any more of this. We have work to do. We've been standing here like a bunch of school kids. All this time, that old man has been lying there suffering. A couple of men of you men cut two poles and make a stretcher to carry him. While the men were getting poles, Papa heated the coonskins again and rewrapped Grandpa's foot. With belts and long leather laces from their boots, the hunters made a stretcher. And very gently, they put Grandpa on it. Again, Mr. Crowell took command. Well, part of us will start for the camp with him. The others will go after the dogs. Here, take this gun, Papa said. I'll go with him. Looking at me, Mr. Kyle said, well, Come on, son. I want to see your hounds. Mr. Benson led the way. As soon as we get out of this cane, he said, we may be able to hear them. They have the coon tree and that big black gum tree. You're going to see a sight. <laughs> now, I mean a sight. They walked a ring around that tree, clear down through the ice and snow. You can see the bare ground. Well, I wonder why they did that, someone asked. I don't know, Mr. Benson replied. Well, unless they ran in that circle to keep themselves from freezing to death or to keep the coon in the tree. I figured I knew why my dogs were covered with ice. The coon had probably crossed the river and maybe several times. Old Dan and Little Ann would have followed him. They had come out of the river with their coats dripping wet and the freezing blast of the blizzard had done the rest. Nearing the tree, we stopped and stared. Well, did you ever see anything like that? Mr. Benson asked. When I first saw them, I thought they were white wolves. My dogs hadn't seen us when we came up. They were trotting around and round, just as Mr. Benson had said. We could see the path that they'd worn down through the ice and snow until the bare black earth was visible. Like ghostly white shadows, around and around they trotted. In a low voice, someone said, They know that if they stop, they'll freeze to death. It's unbelievable, said Mr. Kyle. Come on, we must do something quick. With a choking sob, I ran for my dogs. On hearing our approach, they sat down and started bawling treed. I noticed their voices didn't have that solid ring. Their ice-covered tails made a rattling sound as they switched this way and on that on the icy ground. A large fire was built, and standing my dogs close to the warm heat, <clears throat> the gentle hands of the hunters went to work. With handkerchiefs and scarves heated steaming hot, little by little the ice was thawed from their bodies. If they had ever lain down, someone said, they would have frozen to death. They knew it, another said. That's why they kept running in that circle. What I can't understand is why they stayed with the tree, Mr. Benson said. I've seen hounds stay with a tree for a while, but not in a northern blizzard. Men, said Mr. Kyle. People have been trying to understand dogs ever since the beginning of time. <laughs> One never knows what they'll do. You can read every day where a dog saved the life of a drowning child or lay down his life for his master, but some people call this loyalty. I don't. I may be wrong, but I call it love. The deepest kind of love. After these words were spoken, a thoughtful silence settled over the men. The mood was broken by the deep growling voice I had heard back in the washout. Well, it's a shame that people all over the world can't have that kind of love in their hearts, he said. There would be no wars, slaughter, or murder, no greed or selfishness. It'd be the kind of world that God wants us to have, and you know, a wonderful world. After all the ice was thawed from my dogs and their coats were dried out, I could see they were all right. I was happy again and felt good all over. One of the hunters said, Do you think those hounds are thawed out enough to even fight a coon? Sure, we'll just run them out of that tree, I said. At the crack of the gun, the coon ran far out on the big limb and stopped. 
Again, the hunter sprinkled him with bird shot. This time he jumped. Hitting the ground, he crouched down. Old Dan made a lunge, and just as he reached him, the coon sprang straight up and came down on his head. Holding on with his claws, the coon sank his teeth and in a long, tender ear. Old Dan was furious. He started turning in a circle, bawling with pain. Little Dan was trying little Ann was trying hard to get a hold of the coon, but she couldn't. Because of his fast circling, old Dan's feet flew out from under him and he fell. This gave little Ann a chance. Darting in, her jaws closed on the back of the coon's neck. I knew the fight was over. Arriving back at the camp, I saw that all the tents had been taken down but ours. The hunter said, Everyone was in a hurry to get out before another blizzard sets in. Papa told me to take my dogs into the tent as Grandpa wanted to see them. I saw tears in my grandfather's eyes as he talked to them. His ankle was wrapped in bandages. His foot and toes were swollen to twice their normal size. They had turned a greenish-yellow collar. <clears throat> Placing my hand on his foot, I could feel the feverish heat. Dr. Latham came over. Are you ready to go now? He asked. Snorting and growling, Grandpa said, I told you I wasn't going anywhere until I see the gold cup handed this boy. Turning to face the crowd, Dr. Latham said, all right, man, let's get this over with. I want to get this man to town. That's one of the meanest sprains I've ever seen, and it should be put in a cast, but I don't have any plaster of Paris with me. The hunter who had come by our tent collecting the jackpot money came up to me. Handing me the box, he said, well, Here you are, son. Well, there's over $300 in this box. It's all yours. Turning to the crowd, he said, Fellows, I can always say this. On this hunt, I've seen two of the finest little coon hounds I ever hope to see. There was a roar of approval from the crowd. Looking down, I saw the box was almost full of money. I was shaking all over. I tried to say thanks, but it was only a whisper. Turning, I handed the box to my father. As his rough old hands closed around it, I saw a strange look come over his face. He turned and looked at my dogs. Some of the men started shouting, Here it is! The crowd parted and the judge walked through. I saw the gleaming metal of the gold cup in his hand. After a short speech, he handed it to me, saying, Son, <laughs> this makes me very proud. It's a great honor to present you with this championship cup. The crowd exploded. The hunter's shouts were deafening. I don't know from where the two silly old tears came. They just squeezed their way out. I felt them as they rolled down my cheeks. One dropped on the smooth surface of the cup and splattered. I wiped it away with my sleeve. Turning to my dogs, I knelt down and showed the cup to them. Little Ann licked it. Old Dan sniffed one time and then turned his head away. The judge said, Son, there's a place on the cup to engrave the names of your dogs. I can take it to Oklahoma City and have it done, or you can have it done yourself. The engraving charge has already been paid out by the association. Looking at the cup, it seemed that far down in the gleaming shadows I could see two wide blue eyes glued to the window pane. I knew that my little sister was watching the road and waiting for our return. Looking back at the judge, I said, If you don't mind, I'll take it with me. My grandfather can send it in for me. Laughing, he said, <laughs> well, That's all right. Handing me a slip of paper, he said, This is the address where you should send it. Grandpa said, Now that that's settled, I'm ready to go town. Turning to Papa, he said, You'll have to bring the buggy and... I wish you'd look after my stock. I know Grandma will want to go in with us, and there will be no one there to help there to feed them. Tell Bill Lowry to come up and take care of the store. You'll find the keys in the usual place. Hey, we'll, we'll take care of everything, Papa said. Don't worry about a thing. I don't intend to stop until we get back, because it looks like we're in for some more bad weather. I went over and kissed Grandpa goodbye. He pinched my cheeks and whispered, We'll teach these city slickers that they can't come up here and beat our dogs. I smiled. Grandpa was carried out and made comfortable in the back seat of Dr. Latham's car. I stood and watched as it wheezed and bounced its way through out of sight. <coughs> While I'm harnessing the team, Papa said, you take the tent down and pack our gear. On the back seat of the buggy, I made a bed out of our bed clothes. Down on the floorboards, I fixed a nice place for my dogs. All through the night, the creaking wheels of our buggy moved on. Several times I woke up. My father had wrapped a tarp around himself. Reaching down, I could feel my dogs. They were warm and comfortable. Early the next morning, we stopped for breakfast. While Papa tended to the team, I turned my dogs loose and let them stretch. We made some good time last night, Papa said. If everything goes right, we'll be home long before dark. 
Reaching Grandpa's store in the middle of the afternoon, Papa said, I'll put the team in the barn and feed the stock while you unload the buggy. Coming back from the barn, he said, In the morning, I'll go over and tell Bill Lowry to come up and open the store. Looking around, he said, It snowed more here than it did while we were, while we were hunting. Feeling big and important, I said, I don't like the looks of this weather. We better be scooting for home. Papa laughed. <laughs> sure. You're not in a hurry to get home to show off the gold cup, he asked. A smile was my only answer. 200 yards this side of our house, <clears throat> the road made a turn around a low foothill, shutting our house off from view. Papa said, You're going to see a scramble as soon as we round that bend. It was more of a stampede than a scramble. The little one came out first and all but tore the screen door from its hinges. The older girls passed her just beyond the gate. In her hurry, she slipped and fell face down in the snow and she started crying. The older girls ran up asking for the cup. Holding it high over my head, I said, Now wait a minute! I've got another one for you two. I held the small silver cup out to them. And while they were fighting over it, I ran to the little one. Picking her up, I brushed the snow from her long braided hair and her tear-stained face. I told her there was no use to cry, that I had brought the gold cup to her, and no one else was going to get it. Reaching for the cup, she wrapped her small arms around it. Squeezing it up tight, she ran for the house to show it to Mama. Mama came out on the porch. She was just as excited as the girls were. <clears throat> she held out her arms. I ran to her. She hugged me and kissed me. Oh, it's good to have you home again, she said. Look what I have, Mama, the little one cried, and it's all mine. She held the gold cup out with her two small hands. As Mama took the beautiful cup, she looked at me, and she started to say something but was interrupted by the cries from the other girls. We have one too, Mama, they cried, and it's just as pretty as that one. It's not either, the little one piped in a defiant voice. It's not even as big as mine. Two cups, Mama exclaimed. Did you win two? Yes, Mama, I said. Little Ann won that one all by herself. The odd expression on my mother's face was wonderful to see. Holding a cup in each hand, she held them out in front of her. Two, she said. A gold one and a silver one. Who would have thought anything so wonderful could have happened to us? I'm so proud, so very proud. Handing the cups back to the girls, she walked over to Papa. After kissing him, he, she said, I just can't believe everything that has happened. I'm so glad you went along. Did you enjoy yourself? With a smile on his face, Papa almost shouted, Enjoy myself? Well, I've never had such a time in my life. His voice trailed off to a low calm. Well, that is except for one thing. Grandpa, he had a bad accident. Yes, I know, Mama said. One of Tom Logan's boys was at the store when they arrived. He came by and told us all about it. The doctor said it wasn't as bad as it looked, and he was pretty sure Grandpa would be home in a few days. I was happy to hear this news, <clears throat> and I can tell by the pleased look on my father's face that he was glad to hear it too. On entering the house, Papa said, Oh, I almost forgot. He handed the box of money to Mama. What's this? she asked. Oh, it's just a little gift from old Dan and little Ann, Papa said. Mama opened the box. I saw the collar drain from her face. Her hands started trembling. Turning her back to us, she walked over and set it on the mantel. A peaceful silence settled over the room. I could hear the clock ticking away, and the fire in the fireplace crackled and popped. Turning from the mantel, Mama looked straight at us, her lips tightly pressed together to keep them from quivering. Walking slowly to Papa, she buried her face in his chest. I heard her say, Thank God, my prayers have been answered. There was celebration in our home that night. To me, it was like a second Christmas. Mama opened a jar of huckleberries and made a large cobbler. Papa went to the smokehouse and came back with a hickory cured ham. We sat down to a feast of the ham, huge plates of fried potatoes, ham, gravy, hot cornbread, fresh butter, and wild bee honey. And during the course of the meal, the entire story of the championship hunt was told. Some by Papa, but mostly by me. And just when everything was so perfect and peaceful, an argument sprang up between the two oldest girls. It seemed that each one wanted to claim the silver cup, and just when they were on the verge of sawing it in two so that each would have their allotted share, Papa settled the squabble by giving the oldest one the silver dollar, and once again, peace and harmony was restored. That night, as I was preparing for bed, a light flashed by my window. Puzzled, I tiptoed over it and peeked through the pane. It was Mama, carrying my lantern and two large plates of heaped high with food. 
She was heading for the doghouse. Setting the light down on the ground in front of it, she called to my dogs. And while they were eating, Mama did something I couldn't understand. She knelt down on her knees in prayer. After they had eaten their food, Mama started petting them. I could hear her voice, but I couldn't make out her words. Whatever she was saying must have pleased them. Little Ann wiggled and twisted, and even old Nan wagged his long red tail, which was very unusual. Papa came out, and I saw him put his arm around Mama. Side by side, they stood for several minutes looking at my dogs. When they turned to enter the house, I saw Mama dab at her eyes with her apron. Lying in bed, staring into the darkness, I tried hard to figure out the strange actions of my parents. Why had Mama knelt in prayer in front of my dogs? And why had she wept? <clears throat> I was running all the way the whys around in my mind when I heard them talking. I know, Papa said. But I think there's a way. I'm going to have to talk with Grandpa. I, I don't think that old foot is his is ever going to be the same again. He's going to need some help around the store. I knew they were talking about me, but I couldn't understand what they meant. Then I thought, why, that's it. They want me to help Grandpa. That'd be alright with me. I could still hunt every night. Feeling smart for figuring out their conversation, I turned over and fell asleep. (laughs) 